Hey guys, this is Brian Ellis, and welcome to The Fail Journal. My hopes to inspire people to chase their dreams and pursue their passions by taking risks and embracing the lessons taught by my favorite coach and mentor, failure. What's up, guys? This is Brian Ellis, and welcome to The Fail Journal. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. I'm super excited about today. Before we jump into our episode today, I have a confession to make. So, I don't know if I announced this a couple episodes ago on the podcast, but one of my goals in life was to buy an exotic sports car. And so last week, I finally was able to drive to San Diego and get a Lamborghini, which I'm super excited about. Now, there's kind of a bittersweet in announcing this. There's there's one part of me that's like, I'm super excited to like show my friends and drive this around because it's a car I've wanted for a long time. The other part is, it's like, I feel kind of like an asshole entrepreneur who just bought a really expensive sports car. And now I'm learning how to be like, oh, I feel kind of like a douchebag driving this around. But I'm super excited about it because it's one of those dreams that I've had for a long time as an entrepreneur or, you know, even as an artist, whatever you see these, you know, I've seen Lamborghinis driving around my whole life and I'm like, oh, those are so sick. It'd be so cool to get one. And one of the things I've had to play with and being an entrepreneur and especially going into, you know, being like a successful entrepreneur where I have more money and I'm able to do certain things is learning to shut off the judgment that I feel when I step into different arenas or different levels of success and people are like, oh, well, you're just doing that as a flex or you're just doing that to show off and this, that, and the other. And one of the cool things that I've noticed in buying this new car or whatever is that, um, and I was even talking to my business partner about it, is that like kind of the kid and everybody comes out a little bit whenever they talk to me about the Lamborghini, which is crazy because I meet people all around Reading, because I pull up to a stop sign and someone rolls down their window and they're like, bro, nice car, that's so sick. You know, you know, how fast does it go? How much horsepower, how much torque? And it starts like crazy conversation where I get to know these people and meet these people and find out what they're pursuing. And then they're inspired by seeing a sports car. So they start telling me all about their entrepreneur journey, all the things they're going after. Yesterday, I got to go on a photo shoot with this guy who only shoots exotic cars. And so he messaged me, was like, hey dude, I would love to do a photo shoot with you on this car. And I was like, yeah, sounds fun. Let's do it. So we went out and while we were doing it, his, um, his photography partner was like, oh yeah, I have these three different side hustles and these things I'm pursuing. And we got to have a conversation about like what he's passionate and going after. And I was like, you know, what's really cool about this car, even though a lot of people look at that and think, oh, that's just a weird flex. or that's just a overuse of money or what, what have you. It's interesting the kind of conversation it opens with other ambitious people. It's interesting the type of conversation that opens with other entrepreneurs and people who are wanting to get to the level to buy something like that. Um, And everything that I pursue in life, my desire is that whatever I do, it inspires other people to take risks, to go after their passions, and to also see that it's possible to check off these dreams or these bucket list things that they have to do. And what's interesting is less than it hasn't felt like as much of a flex or quote unquote douchebag thing to own as much as it's been like, wow, it's been cool to see people get inspired when they have a conversation with me just about a freaking car. Like that's all it is. It's just a stupid, it's just a stupid car. It's, there's nothing crazy about it or anything, but it's, it's just been really cool. And I'm super thankful for that. And so what I want to encourage you guys is as you guys are going after your dreams, as you're pursuing entrepreneurship, you're pursuing art, you're pursuing, you know, different passions and pursuit you have, as you start reaching these new levels of success, don't be ashamed about the things that you're going after, the things that you're buying, the things that you're getting, or the, the new levels of breakthrough you're walking in, because if your, your heart intention is set right, like good fruit's going to come out of whatever you do. And it's so interesting to think like, wow, it's actually cool to see cool fruit coming out of something as weird as buying a sports car. So I just want to share that with you guys. It's such a, it's such an interesting, weird thing, but it's something, it's a journey I'm still going on as an, as a young entrepreneur and, you know, one who's still experimenting with life and going after different things. And so it's just kind of a cool thing that I've, um, noticed. Um, But that was kind of a little rabbit trail. I'm really excited about today's episode because I have a really dear friend with me, uh, uh, Fabiano Altamura. So I've known uh, Fabiano for a few years now, and he's an actor, director, and producer. And um, you guys can check him out on IMDb, Instagram, Facebook. You want TikTok yet? 
No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, bro? I've uh, I've just deleted my Instagram. You deleted your, you deleted it or deactivated it? No, deactivated. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. I deactivated. I'm like. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be in your bedroom and you just scroll two hours late. You still that's true. Achieve nothing. Yeah. So I'm like purge for the time being. (laughs) (laughs) Is that like a New Year's resolution that Uh, you did? No, I did it before. I did it from the first of December. You know, so all everything with the New Year's resolution, I've been doing way before, bro. So I was like, I come into the new year, I'm hitting it, but I've already got momentum around it. So I was like, stop social media for the time being. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of it's not a bad time to stop social media with all the crazy stuff that's happening in the world, and it's like, dude, you know. What's insane is um, I don't share like my political stance on this podcast just for my own safety sake and safety. Are you sure? Yeah, you I know. Chat you know yeah, right exactly. Now? I'm like, I love Trump. I love Biden. Yeah. I, I'm on the fence, you know? <laughs> That's what I say. No, but what's, what's really crazy that I've noticed is like people on both sides are so mean right now. Nobody's to, listening to each other. No. And I, I'm, I, I'm not posting, I'm not commenting on anybody's stuff because I'm like, I'm not wanting to just add fuel to any fire, but it's breaking my heart to see like, I mean, because like, like I have my opinion and my perspective and what I assume is going on. Sure. I'm not in the freaking White House, so I don't know what's exactly. actually going on. Yeah. But from my, in my room, scrolling through Instagram and Googling shit, like I have my opinions and, but I'm not going to, you know, call all these other people names or assume their agenda and everything because I disagree with what they believe is happening in the world and their ignorant perspective, but it's a good time to get off social media for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Just because I've, I have a tendency to really try and push people's buttons. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm like, is yeah, fine. I ain't going to do that. It's just, no. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So that's good. So you, you're off social media. Do you have any other new year's resolutions or things you're, you're going for this year? Yeah, I mean, my, I, bro, I've been really working out hard because I, I, I think since COVID, I just got, I just got a bit lazy. Mm. So from March to kind of like August, I didn't do a ton. I mean, yeah. I worked, but I mean, with regards to working out, gyms were shut. So anyway, from October, me and a buddy, he, he's in politics, ironically, um, we just started getting up 6.15 to 7. Oof. We hit the workout hard. Yeah. You know, high intensity. Um, because, bro, when I go and see my family in Europe in August, I want to be shredded. Let's go. That's a good motivation Let's for go. it. it is Are you? Motivation. Have you always been a morning person? I mean, have I always been a morning person? I wouldn't say I've always been a morning person. Yeah. There was a time back in the UK when, like, we've been in the US nearly nine years now. And um, I... So I'm a Christian, so Mm -hmm. as you know. So I would, I had this thing that I felt that the Lord said to me, get up at 5 a.m. every day. Oh, wow. So I would get up at 5 a.m. That lasted about six months. Then when I came to um, the U.S., Mm -hmm. I started getting up at 5 a.m. Then he said, would you get up at 4 a.m. for me? So do may as well just not go to bed at that point. (laughs) Well, for two years, I ended up getting up at four. Wow. And then when work just started to get too much, Mm -hmm. I kind of cut it back to like about six. But Mm -hmm. now I'm kind of relatively up at like five. Five. But I'm going to bed at like 10, you know. So I'm only getting six hours sleep before Mm -hmm. I was getting like five. Wow. Um, But then I realized that was just kind of knocking up my nervous system. So I like that. That's crazy. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm a. I've tried to be the early riser. The only time I actually consistently got up early was when I did, when I was in your conservatory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was waking up. And I liked it yeah. because, but I remember waking up early and being like, oh man, like I love waking up this early. I wish I didn't have to go to school and I could just drink coffee and journal all day. Or I had, exactly, it, was like, yeah. it was like, but I would never make myself get up early outside of being forced to. And now I'm like trying, like my goal, this is going to sound so bad, but my goal is to start waking up at seven every morning and I'm working my way slowly. I was talking yeah. to a friend on Instagram yesterday. She lives in San Diego and she posted and was like up for the sunrise. And I'm like, oh, how do you do it? I want to <laughs> get to that point because there is something about waking up early. And here's, 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 here's my thing. This is kind of a rabbit trail. Waking up early is always one of those things where the elites and the successful are like, you can't be successful unless you're up early before everybody else. And I've always, as you know, always been a rule breaker or a challenger of the rules. And so when somebody says you can't be successful without waking up early, I'm like, really? Well, what about just staying up super late and working late into the night? Or, you know, but so 
my company became successful with me sleeping until noon, but that's because we were working till four in the morning. So it was like, and now my schedule is so different. I still don't wake up, but I can see even the mental benefits that come from waking up with the sun and how like our bodies are almost, I think some, some doctor was telling me our bodies were created to wake up with the sun and go to sleep with the sun. Weirdly. Yeah, I mean, I, I th- that would be cool, but I mean, you couldn't live your life like that, could you? It like, would be hard. I'm going You're to bed social at 445 life. Yeah, in, in the winter, Redding, California. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, listen, you've got to find your own rhythm, haven't yeah. you? Mm-hmm. Like now, you, you your business is afforded you that you can choose your schedule, mm-hmm. right? Which is great. I mean, for me, it's it was for a start, it was a spiritual thing. Yeah, and then it's become a discipline thing. Gotcha. So I would say I'm, I I tend towards being very very disciplined. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point is as well, I don't want that discipline to rule me yeah. if I'm not getting enough sleep. So on a That's weekend, good. I'll sleep in. Mm-hmm. But during the week, you know, I I do get up early just because my focus is I want to achieve something before I buy, I get to the summit. It's not a vain thing, you know, bro. It's more yeah. like I just, I know now that I'm 45 years old. Mm-hmm. It's not that I've abused my body in any way, shape or form, but I know that if I'm going to get another 40 years out mm-hmm. of this life, yeah. I want to be focused and motivated to get the best I can out of this body. Totally. Yeah. You know? That's good. Do you, was, um, cause you did conservatory. I did. Yeah. It was, yeah. did that as a, uh, were you 18 when you went to conservatory? I was 19. 19. Yeah. Did that shape a little bit of discipline for you uh, into your adult and your adult years? It did. I mean, so literally, I mean, for me, bro, discipline has not been something that's just always come easy, something mm-hmm. I've had to cultivate. Mm-hmm. So whenever it was something that I didn't enjoy, I don't know if I was ever truly, truly disciplined. When it came to going to conservatory, I th- that year previous, I took previously I took a year off and I, I, I started off doing law and business at university and I lasted three months. I just couldn't do it. It was mm-hmm. the driest thing I've ever had to do. And in that year, I ended up getting a play, a prof- my first pro play, even before I'd even trained, and I wow. got a short movie. And then I went to conservatory, and because I always wanted to act, I mm-hmm. never really deviated. The only reason why I kind of think I deviated is because my, sad, my dad said, it's not a great industry to go into. How can you do that? What I realized in him saying no, he wasn't saying no. He was just challenging me to see how hungry I was. It's true. That's good. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. when I went to conservatory, I knew it's all I wanted to do. Mm. So I worked harder than everybody else. So I would literally go from like eight to four. Then I would literally go to the theater because I was working on Phantom of the Opera. Oh, wow. I would be there at 515, work till 11, get back home, cook myself a meal and stretch because I did a double major in acting and dance because I wanted to get in the splits. And I did that for two, three years, bro. Wow. Dang. So yeah. w- what about leaving conservatory? Do you think a lot of the discipline stayed? Was it, were you able to, um, you know, carry that into as you were pursuing acting as a young man or how did that, how was that? I actually, when I left conservatory, the thing was, I think I left really entitled. Okay. I actually think for me, when I left that I was going to get picked up straight away. Interesting. Because I think I knew my craft, but I didn't know who I was. Wow. Okay. So everything... I got my identity actually from what I did. Now, Mm -hmm. if you know who you are, I don't think that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But for me, it wasn't a good thing. Okay. So I actually met my wife as soon as I finished my postgraduate. I went to a conservatory called the Arts Educational in London. Andrew Lloyd Webber is the president of that school. And um, I was very hungry for the craft, but I think into my marriage, because I wasn't constantly working to start with, when I wasn't working, I went into a real funk. Like I just had no purpose. I didn't know what to do. So I think from that, I became, there were, there were seasons that I was really lazy. Hmm. What, um, I, I, and I've known you for several years. And one of the things that I know you talk about the most is separating your identity from your craft. Um, and even the exercises. So also, for those of you who do not know uh, Fab, he is the dean of an acting conservatory here in Redding, California as well, that um, that he started four years ago now? Four years ago, yeah. Four years ago. Holy shit. Um, time flies, bro. <laughs> like, oh, it flies. It's, you're not kidding me. Yeah. It w- and, and the funny connection is um, I went to his conservatory for the first year, and that's how I met my business partner, Ben Day, is we were both acting students in the school. And um, one of the things, one of the lessons that I never forget is you, that's one of your big things is separating the identity from your craft. And, um, what I'm curious is I, to this day, 
am terrible at that. Like I just resigned as CEO of Adventure Challenge and there's no financial loss for me by doing that. Yeah. I still make the same money. It's just, I don't do the work now. Yeah. However, I had like an emotional spiral yeah. for two, three days when I resigned. And I noticed, oh, I, and I knew what it was. I'm very emotionally aware, but I was like, I still have attached a lot of my identity to Adventure Challenge and because there's a lot, you know, you, you build a company, it becomes successful, you get affirmation, you get the attention of different people. And you're like, yeah, I am important because of this company. Not, so, not consciously, but subconsciously, you start to, you know, connect your value to the value of the company. Yeah, of course. And then you step down and you're like, where's my value? <laughs> like, yeah. oh God. And I had to like spend so much time you know, going back to the core of me and being like, oh, I'm, I'm actually, my value and worth does not come from running mm -hmm. this company. But it's it's a daily, and I, I think it's easy as an ambitious person to do that. And I'm like, how did you stop doing that? Because you, you said you realized once you graduated, you were very, you were entitled. And so, you, you know, a lot of your identity was wrapped up in that. I see a lot of actors who leave training or they're not currently working and they're in LA and they're trying really hard and their lives are just in pieces because they're yeah. not doing what they feel like is the thing that gives them worth. Yeah. Does that makes sense. I think, you know, I live by the, I lived by that kind of adage, you know, you're only as good as your last job mm -hmm. or the last star you work. And I think now what I've learned now that I know who I am and we talk about, you know, we talk a lot, don't we about find out who you are so you can figure out what your destiny is, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think when my acting was tied to my identity, it really, I really was only as good as my last job. Because mm. if I work with a star, or if I work, you know, in a really prestigious theater or film, when I then didn't have anything to go to, I would spiral like you just mentioned when you left Adventure Challenge, right? But when I really started to get to grips when knowing that my acting was an overflow mm. of my identity, yeah, that's when I could say, Oh, acting isn't what I do. It's who I am as well. Yeah. Because it's an overflow of my, my, my life, my, mm -hmm. my desires, you know, who I've been created to be. Totally. So I think now that I do that, if I act or I don't act, I'm still comfortable with who I am, but it still doesn't mean it stops me from being driven and focused totally, yeah. to continue pursuing what I really want to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what would you say to the, I don't like using this term, but like the starving actor in LA or London, Atlanta, Dallas, who's, who they haven't worked in a while. Maybe they yeah, haven't yeah. worked at all. Maybe they've yeah. been there for years and they're not. And their value, their self-worth, what they're feeling, who they feel about themselves is not great because, yeah. you know, hey, what do you do for a living? Uh, actor. Oh, what have you been in recently? Nah, leave me alone. I don't know. Nothing. You know what I'm saying? That, that I whole, do, I get it. And like what... I would love just for, because I, I, I love your perspective on this. I'd love for you to even speak to that group of people. And, and, and those of you listening, obviously this translates to more than just acting. It can be anything, entrepreneurship, yeah. painting, race car driving, whatever, you know, but I, I, I love your, your perspective on that. Yeah. I, do you know what, Brian, for me, it's, it's hunger separates you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Anything that I've had to do in life if I've not necessarily initially felt motivated, I've had to find something to anchor to, okay. to motivate, whether it be faith, whether it be a project, whatever that be. So if I was out of work, um, I would be constantly in motion to try and get work, create work. Like I remember there's one time I just in Romeo and Juliet with James McAvoy and West Side Story with James McAvoy. So kind of like right before he broke. Um, and then I went into a period of like a few months where I had no work. So I set up a radio station. Oh, right. Wow. And I decided, and that's what actually helped me get the tools to become an entrepreneur, the tools to become a producer, you know, that kind of thing of I'm having to start something from nothing. Yeah. So even though you, you don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. You know what it's like, mm -hmm. you know, having a, bringing a concept to market, mm -hmm. bringing something to market, even yourself to market, because as an actor, producer, director, you are the product. Mm -hmm. Right. So that hunger that I cultivated um, really, really helped me. So I would say to whatever you want to call starving actors, like your freedom is in finding something to create. Yeah. And if you don't have the money to create it, that's fine. Just keep creating, whether yeah. it be journaling, whether it be finding a book that you want to take and make into a screenwriter, you know, into a screenplay. Yeah. 
acquire skills. Yeah, that's awesome. Because knowledge, knowledge is very important. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't know something, there's no excuse nowadays. Yeah, for real. To <laughs> not be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Then you have to define what success is for you, right? Because success might be, I, I, I've not been doing anything till 12 a.m., 12 p.m., right? Success to you might be, oh, I'm going to get up at 10 a.m., watch masterclass on how to act, and at least start making those baby steps mm-hmm. forward yeah. to actually contribute to our or contribute just to this life and yeah. to be you know to be to, to give yourself a chance to do it because that every day you wait every day you make a decision not to do something mm-hmm. it's a decision not to do something yeah you know what's interesting is is i love differentiating victim mindset and the powerful mindset right and a lot of what you're talking about is is being in being in control of you and your life and I see so many artists adapt or kind of falling into more of the victim mindset because specifically with acting, a lot of the dreams that people have as actors are kind of dependent on circumstances outside of their control to an extent. But in my opinion, it's kind of like, it's kind of like Texas Hold'em. A lot of people look at that and they say it's luck. You know, and it's really, I think somebody said it was 20% luck, 80% skill. And, and a lot of with, um, with acting the industry or pursuing your craft, a lot of people are like, well, I'm just waiting for the call. I'm waiting for my agent to get me a good audition. I'm waiting to book an agent who thinks I'm great. And it's like, well, what are the things you're doing now? And one thing I love about Will Smith is he says, uh, success comes when preparation meets opportunity. Right. And we try to skip the preparation and we're just, we're, we're off seeking opportunity. And then we might get tidbits of opportunity, but because we have the lack of preparation, we drop the ball when the opportunity comes. Yeah. And so what I love to hear, what, what I love, love what you're saying is you can wake up and say, I'm going to do um, master gra- a class with Dustin Hoffman. He has one, right? He was yeah, one of the first Kevin ones. Yeah, Spacey and Natalie Portman. They're not yeah. all fantastic, but you know what I mean? Yeah, you it's, can, start. it's something. Yeah. I can sign up. I can buy an Uta Hata, Uta, Uta ha- ha- Hagen. <laughs> Hagen, I I mentioned her because I restarted are. reading nice. her books and yeah. doing her exercises from Good. from school. Um, but you can you can grab a book, you can you can watch stuff. You can always be continuing to empower yourself. So when the opportunity comes, even if it's a small one, who knows what doors it opens f- right. for other opportunities. Yeah. And um, so I love that that it's like you might not be able to act in the project you want, but damn it, you can get up and write. You can get yeah. up and do exercises. You can get up and go to the freaking gym. You can, you know, um, I love that about you. I also love your mindset, especially you being a dean of a conservatory, you have a huge emphasis on training. Yeah. And, you know, even the example I've, I've heard you use that I like is the example of, you know, people see artists or people go, oh, I want to be an actor. I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to pursue acting as if it's a hobby or this cool you know, thing they want to get into. And it's like, acting is a craft. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> just like you wouldn't want a brain surgeon, this is the example you use, exactly. working on you who's like, I want to be a brain surgeon. Exactly. I'm going to go to the hospitals and apply to yeah. be a doctor. And they're like, where's your training, dumbass? And you're like, well, I don't have any training, but I'm an aspiring doctor. Like, yeah. I need to put me in front of a patient and I will yeah. get better. I'm not going to operate you uh, operate yeah. on you without any training. Exactly. It's ludicrous. Yeah, it is. And it's the same, you know, with acting where it's like, no, there is, y- y- uh, there are people who have made it without the crazy amounts of training. Yeah. But that's looking at the 0.001% of yeah, people it's who the made exception, it. not the rule, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Leonardo DiCaprio didn't train, mm. you know, I mean, he had a, I mean, you know, he was obviously one of those very gifted people. Yeah you know, one of the best actors on the planet. But I think, you know what, man, it's like, you, you've got to put your hand to something. Mm-hmm. Now, whether you can do, you, you can give or dedicate three to four years of your life to, to conservatory, great, if you can. If you can't, at least be in classes. Totally, yeah. You know, but the idea of, of moving to LA on a whim that you want to be an actor, I think has mm-hmm. been perpetuated by reality TV shows, mm-hmm. you know, or TikTok stars or Instagram stars, mm-hmm. you know, anybody on social media that's not necessarily got a talent has become famous. Totally, yeah. And I think, you know, people look to that and go, oh, I don't necessarily have a skill set. But you realize those people that have actually made it on YouTube, well, I've worked hard. Yeah. They've understood the business. Mm-hmm. You know, they may have started kind of even in, in an organic way, mm-hmm. but at least they started. And in that momentum, 
they found out how to do it. But I, I think people actually struggle with the emphasis to start. Yeah. You actually have to start. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. And it's, it's really interesting because, um, you know, people will get motivated to start. Like they'll get, they'll get, they'll listen to this podcast and be like, I'm going to go, I'm going to go freaking do it. And one thing that I'm obviously, you know, this, this being the podcast called the fail journal is my passion is to get people inspired to start, but then realize when they decide I'm starting, they're deciding I'm ready to go fail. Yeah. I'm ready to go look like a freaking idiot. I'm ready to go look like an amateur, like a noob, like I don't know what I'm doing. I'm ready right. to embarrass myself. And if you're not saying those things, mm. you go there and you, you go to class, you're like, I'm here because I'm going to be an actor. I need to look cool. I need to know, look like I know what I'm doing. And we, I've seen it. You've seen it. You've of had course. hundreds of students yeah, go totally, through your school and you, totally. see, you see the ones come in who are like, oh, I was in a... I was in a movie once, like I know what I'm doing. I'm here to show that I already know what I'm doing rather than to learn. And it's like, but when you come in with the mindset, I'm ready to fail. Right. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, I think it's it. your relationship with vulnerability, isn't it? Mm-hmm. If you decide to come in and want to look cool, yeah. that's just your, it's a facade mm-hmm. that is kind of hiding your insecurity. Your biggest security comes when like, I'm not afraid to fail. Because I understand there's a learning objective that happens there, right? Yeah. So as an actor, you know you're never going to get every single script dialed. Mm -hmm. That's why they're called multiple takes. Yeah, exactly. You never go to a (laughs) state, like uh, see a play without understanding the rehearsal process, Mm -hmm. right? Now, in essence, what I'm doing is I'm not necessarily setting myself up for failure, but I'm willing to take risks that may or may not be the right choice. Totally. But at least I've made a choice. Yeah. Because people equate failing to failure and mm-hmm. it isn't. Yeah. Failure only happens when I choose not to fail anymore. Yeah, that's I've good. I've become a failure because I've decided not to take any more risks. That's good, yeah. And I've just learned to live with a relationship of, right, I'm going to be vulnerable in front of my, my employees, right? And go, I know I'm going to get feedback mm. and I'm going to fail. And I would rather be that person that works on my issues yeah. rather than be one that goes, I'm going to be a control freak and a dictator. Mm-hmm. And I think I've been there, right? Mm-hmm. You know, when you're finding your levels of responsibility and companies grow and you become more successful in this and that, you think I've got to, I've got to harbor this mm. authority over you rather than going, no, okay, there is a hierarchy. Mm-hmm. But if I fail in front of you, I'm going to be vulnerable enough to go, I'm sorry I made that mistake. How can I put it right? That's good. Let's make the environment better. Yeah. You know? And dear God, it's so hard to fail. It's so hard to embrace failure as a leader sometimes. Yeah. Because now, this is not me dogging on the church, but what I've experienced a lot in the church is when you fail, you're not qualified to be a leader. You're not qualified to lead. You have to act like you have it all together because if you don't, how can you lead other people this if you're failing and doing this. And so what it created in me as a young kid was, um, I remember being a young boy, maybe 13 and being on the worship team, uh, at my church. So the youth worship band, I was a drummer and I remember 13, I had a PSP PlayStation portable and it was on the internet and found a porn site and was right. like, Oh man, what is this? Oh wow. You know, felt really guilty. And then I went to my youth pastor and was like, man, I, I feel horrible. I, uh, I looked at porn and he was like, man, thank you for telling me you can't be on the worship team anymore because you, if you're struggling with this, how can you lead other people um, to God and all? And it, it created this mindset of, oh crap, like I can't be a leader now. And then it created this, this uh, pattern of, oh, if I, if I stumble or if I make mistakes or I admit to my mistakes, then that takes, that disqualifies me as a leader as a human, I don't quit making mistakes. Like right. I always stumble and make mistakes and, and I'm growing as a, as a young man. But what started to do is I started to hide the mistakes. Right. You, yeah. I shut you down. Exactly. And then you, you have like this dark shame of like, yeah. Oh, you, you see me as a leader, but if you knew what I was struggling with or the things I was going through, I wouldn't be a leader, but I have to live in this. And you see, you know, pastors and ministers and all these other people struggling with this. And so outside of the church, what it created was this thing of, oh, I'm a CEO. I'm a leader here. I have to pretend to have all my shit together and act like I know anything. Right. That lasted for two months. Yeah. And then I was like, no, if I can't admit that I fail 80% of the time and yeah. then 20% 
I make it and maybe it was that 20% that made this company blow up, yeah. then I'm just going to stay here at this level. So I need to surround myself with people who are better than me, who are smarter than totally. me, more intelligent than me. And, um, and so, but yeah, being a leader, I'm like you, you being even the leader of the school, yeah. I can imagine there's been times where it's like learning to be open about your failures and your shortcomings so you can continue to grow. I mean, you know what it was like. You were the first, one of the first students in the school. I mean, like, you know, we, David and I, we, who's been on your podcast, you know, David and I and our wives, we were performers. Mm. We, were, we weren't in academia. Totally, yeah. You know, so you, you sell an idea mm -hmm. of a conservatory of the arts where I'm actually teaching you to align you to become a professional artist. Mm -hmm. We'd never done it before. I mean, it's crazy. Why would we do it in Redding, California? You know, it's <laughs> one of those things. But like, we were, we were just slightly left of center enough mm -hmm. to make it work, I think. Yeah. And now, you know, you've got some of our students that have been signed, some of the top managers on the planet. And, you know, it's kind of like two working for you at the moment. And I like, you know, it's, we fail so much and I think I still fail on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really sad what your worship leader did to you because you know what? It, it, it makes you then, you went in with a heart to bring it out into the light mm -hmm. because you know that's not something you want to live with. Mm -hmm. You don't want to live with looking at porn and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So you bring it into the light. The thing is the church occasionally, if you said can shut you down, if they do that, then like you will take it outside of the church. Mm -hmm. You will go outside and you won't bring it into the light anymore. And we, we, we live with this um, kind of secret life inside that really shuts us down and we don't embrace vulnerability anymore. Yeah. So anytime we fail or anything we fear, we try and control. Yeah. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I don't embrace it anymore, but like opening up to our staff and our students we, we don't always get it right. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how successful you become. I think you still have to hold on to that, that core value. Yeah. The audition room is one of my favorite places in the world. And what's interesting, and I know eventually, because I, I, I'm still pursuing acting. I'm yeah, going yeah. after that. So I know that I have lots more time to spend in the audition room. But a lot of people avoid that room. They don't like that room because it's nervous. They have this high stake mentality around it. One thing that I love to do when I'm casting director in the audition room is seeing an actor who's really withheld, really within their body, really like they're performing, but they're, they're scared to go over the top. They're scared to be told they're giving too much, mm -hmm. that they're going too high. I like to tell actors, go so over the top, we have to tell you to tone it down. Yeah, yeah. And to see people go from this in a box reserve to crazy, like uh, giving a performance that we would never use on set because it's too much. Right. But see them break that box and then go, okay, now tone it down just a little bit. Yeah. If we could get people to do that in their everyday life, yeah. they're so scared to break the rules. They're so right. scared to be told they're too much that they don't give themselves permission to be too much. Right. And that's a bit of what I've even learned in acting with you is yeah. how, how you direct that. Yeah. You see somebody who's so low and you say i need you to go so high i need to tone you down right exactly because it's hard to if people are giving you nothing yeah it's hard to pull it out yeah it's actually exhausting to put it out totally that's why as you say go bigger and i can pull it back at least you're giving me something yeah but i think you hit on the word there it's like um it's about permission yeah giving myself permission that's why i created kind of like the you know why the dream circle was created mm -hmm. because it's a definitive space where you can step into it's a place of permission mm -hmm. with no judgment yeah because i think you know we're told by a lot of people that we have to follow the rules and there's nothing wrong with following the rules mm -hmm. right yeah but not to the extent that it controls you yeah or minimizes who you are yeah you know that's why you find you know actors entrepreneurs whatever think outside of the box because the educational system mm -hmm. will teach you to think in a one specific linear way when we're yeah. like i don't want to think linearly i want to be lateral yeah you know i i don't want to be contained by what yeah. current society tells me i can be not in rebellion but maybe with a little bit of rebellion right mm -hmm. we like to be a, a little, little bit, bit rebellious yeah. yeah and i'm not talking about going against your faith or anything but i'm saying i want to rebel against things when people say it can't be done mm -hmm. you tell me why it can't be done yeah because i don't want you to shackle me bro yeah or I don't want you to tell me why it can't be done because that's what you've been told your that's whole life. That's what you've been told. Or that moment with uh, Will Smith and Jaden Smith in uh, Pursuit of Happiness. Oh, he's like, you can't do that, but you can't do that. that that's unrealistic. They're playing basketball. And then yeah. he's like, don't ever let 
anyone tell you you can't do something. Yep. There was that moment when he was realizing, oh, I'm just repeating what my father said to me. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. listen, you, you, you teach out of what you know. That's why I said yeah. knowledge is important, you know. That's why when my dad, you know, came from a big family, 10 people, right? 10 brothers and sisters, 10 siblings in the south of Italy, right? Mm. And he wanted to be an actor in the early 50s. And his teacher said to him, laughed him out of the room, you will never do it, right? Then my dad moved to the UK, became very successful. Uh, in, in his craft, he became a very successful hairdresser and then businessman. But like, you, whenever somebody says to you and tries to quash your creativity, it's gonna emerge somewhere. Mm -hmm. It has to emerge because you cannot quash the creative. Mm. You can't quash art. So the thing is, it's like once, and now I'm kind of, he's probably living kind of vicariously through me, but um, you know, you, you have to, that's how I teach my kids now. No, if you want to do something, mm -hmm. you do it. Yeah. You pursue it. Don't tell me you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Go and do it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like Josh coming to you, my son. Mm -hmm. Right. You want to write a book? Go and see Brian. But what have you mm -hmm. got to do? I'll sit down with you. Mm -hmm. I will help you mm -hmm. craft it. I will give you every business knowledge I have. Then go. But you've got to pitch it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what do you do? It's just an idea. Yeah. How many good ideas are out there, bro, that nobody act, nobody acts on mm -hmm. because they're worried about failing or whatever that could be in the world right now mm -hmm. that could be the for the betterment of humanity? Yeah, and could set them up for success for of all course. their other ventures. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I want to pivot to ask you a question. Sure, go for it. Because um, I don't know if we've ever had this conversation, but you were in the movie Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider 2, yeah. Tomb Raider 2, that's yeah. right. Was that your first feature? That was my first feature. Yeah, that was my first feature. So I'd spent a lot of time in um, in theater. Uh -huh. Like that was my first love. Okay. Right. And then um, I got the opportunity to like had audition for like the Bourne Identity. And I had loads of kind of big Hollywood film auditions, but mm -hmm. never kind of booked. Yeah. Never booked any of them. And then I ended up booking Tomb Raider and I was on Tomb Raider for about three or four months. And it's not a huge role, but it was like a really great role for my yeah. first Hollywood movie. And um, it was the, one of the most exhilarating, amazing experiences of my entire life. Wow. How, how old were you when that happened? I think I was your age, 27. 27? Yeah. What was it like? Because that, that was your first feature film set. Yeah. What was it like being on that set? Did you experience any failures or moments of education on that what was it yeah well, I did that's a that's a great question so like literally I I had been in this really dark kind of patch and I was I, I I kind of hadn't gone away from my faith but kind of wasn't really practicing it and anyway for about two I'd say about two years prior to no it was wasn't it about six months prior to I'd really start to get ignited again and when it started to get ignited more stuff started mm. coming my way and I went and when I booked the role I just felt so in my zone, right? Mm -hmm. And I was filming in a Greek island called Santorini. Angelina Jolie and Jared Butler were in the movie and Jaimon Honsu, another great actor. Um, and I was so in my zone for the first three weeks of filming. Then I had about eight weeks off before I went back for another three months. In that time of having eight weeks off, I went back to entitlement. Mm -hmm. I went back to everything that I said I didn't want to do because what happened was it was my first experience and making really good money, mm -hmm. right? Uh, my experience of kind of being exposed to these A-list stars. Yeah. And I, I'd never been exposed to that before other than like working with James McAvoy, but this was on a film set. So I started to think like them, not in a bad way, yeah. but I just didn't have... I don't know if I had the emotional capacity or the experience to know what it was to kind of carry that weight mm -hmm. that they carry every single day. Yeah. And I just started to become very full of myself. Mm. And in that eight weeks, I just thought everything was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I'm this in this movie. I'm working with Angelina Jolie. So the thing that I said I wasn't do, wouldn't do was be defined by my previous job or the job that I was in. Yeah. It was the job that elevated me to this kind of persona that I don't know, I wasn't happy with looking back now in hindsight. Yeah. And then I went back for my kind of second, um, second batch of filming and I was just a different person. Really? In what way? I, I felt like I was living in a posture of being an A-list star without being one. 
Gotcha. And with that, had probably just some arrogance to me. Just, you know, now this is my big break. I'm going to make it now. <laughs> that kind of posture. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you want to live like that, from a point of view, I'm seeing it before it manifests, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. But with a good heart. With humility, with yeah. With humility, yeah. but I don't think I had humility. Interesting. I think I went back into that point of entitlement again. It's going to happen to me. Yeah. I'm the next star. It's going to be great. And that's that was really, when it didn't happen, that was a really big lesson that I learned. Interesting. Well, first of all, I can't blame you for experiencing that. You get on, you know, you book your first film when you're with Angelina Jolie and Gerald, but Gerald, Gerald Butler. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, this is your, this is it. You're in your dream. This is the moment you've been waiting for. Yeah. You're on jet skis with Angelina Jolie. You're yeah. going through, you're conquering the world and you go back to your family. What are you doing? I'm in a movie, bitch. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I'm doing my shit. Like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's one of those moments yeah. where it's like, yeah, as a, a young man in your twenties, um, I could, I can feel that, you know, yeah. I can feel the, this is, but then, uh, you know, looking back and you're like, you should have had more humility. Like that, that totally. was, the, that was, that was, st you were starting. That was starting, you know, um, that's so interesting. Yeah. It, it was a really interesting journey because the funny thing was my representation of the time wasn't great. And she said, listen, your career has got to go down now before it could go back up. And I was like, yeah. what are you talking about? You strike while the iron's hot. Yeah. So the movie that I did next was literally back to back, um, got nominated for Best British oh, wow. at the Rain Dance Film Festival, which is like one of the f festivals on track for the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we didn't win, but we came second. We were a runner up. And going from that to that was great. But after that, I think what I was projecting that level of um, it's going to happen to me just didn't translate. Mm. It just, I, I think I was being taught by the Lord that, listen, you you need to learn humility, man, mm -hmm. before, you, before you're entrusted with something else. And that was a really hard lesson for me to learn. Mm. And I think for about 10 years after that, what happened after Tomb Raider was because I had... Um, earn a decent amount of money. I started investing in real estate, kind of like pivoted and took a hiatus from acting probably for about eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. And um, I found something else like business. I love business as much as I did acting, but like there was that pain inside. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That yeah. pain of making a decision to do something else because my first love was always acting, still is, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But you try and fill that gap with something else because you might be good at it. But I think the reason why it didn't happen for me was because I was being taught a lesson. Mm. Interesting. And I covered it up with something else. Yeah. You know? <sighs> That's interesting. Um, do you have any other failures like that while you've pursued this? Oh, bro, I have so many freaking failures. <laughs> I mean, like, where do I even start? I mean, you know... Um, I think a, a lot of my failures have been, um, I mean, you know, you're exposed to, when you work in, like when you work in theater, no matter how, how prolific the role of the actor, you don't earn a ton of money. Yeah. So the moment as an actor, you get exposed to decent amounts of money. I may have made a good few financial mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. So like, yeah, yeah. First time I got into real estate, I'd buy, I'd buy, I bought my first BMW. Mm -hmm. Then I would continue to buy BMW. Then I bought a Jag. We'd go on very luxurious holidays. And I was like, I can sustain that in a boom of the housing market. Mm. But what happens when there's a correction? Yeah. So when the correction came in 2008, I like nearly lost everything. And you know, Damn. it's like multi, multi millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I said, I'm never going to make the mistakes again if I get the opportunity to not lose what I had. Yeah. And I prayed that day and thank goodness I didn't lose, ev I didn't lose everything. I managed to That's keep good. it. Wow. Um, but since then, I don't think I've made those mistakes again. But mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's like when you are faced with something that you've never been faced with before, um, that opens a world up to you. Sometimes you can indulge more than you should mm -hmm. or rather than at the right time, you over, over, overspend. Yeah. And I think they were mistakes that have been, have kind of made me much more fiscally prudent. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I think having two young kids at the time, I spent so much time building the business mm. 
that I focused on the success of wanting to build that business rather than spending time with my kids. Interesting. You know, and um, I hope my kids haven't missed out from it, but I, I, I met with, um, and we were all into emotional health, aren't mm -hmm. we? We love it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we really are into emotional health. I met with a therapist recently who um, actually was a therapist and the pastor of my church. And um, I'd been to some before, amazing ones like Justin and God Unlocked. But I met with this woman and she diagnosed that my nervous system was completely shot. Mm. Because, you know, it's like when you're a bit of a Trojan and you keep going mm -hmm. forward, you don't always look after your own health. Exactly, yeah. And um, she actually, um, dang, where was I going with this? You're talking about missing out on being with your kids or oh, family. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Like that, yeah. So um, I... Uh, Oh, dang, I've lost my train. <laughs> I love that. that. I tell you what, when I'm doing podcasts, with, we did a podcast with Abby. We had those four moments where oh we both goodness. lost it. I was coming in with that whole thing of... Just talking about basically like, you know, the failures that you've, you've learned from, um, you know, being very overly ambitious and yeah. just focusing so much on the craft oh, that you I've got it, I've got it. it. Okay. Yes, and I was like, what do you want to do? And I was like... Well, you know, you always, at times, you will attach success to notoriety. Or yeah. You'll attach tech to finances. Mm -hmm. And then when I really pared it down, it's just, what do you really want? And I said, I just want my kids to be passionate about God. Mm, wow. That's all it was. When you boil it down to everything, that's what I want. And I just want my kids to have, I just want my kids to be well-rounded mm -hmm. kids because at the end of the day, that my success is first and foremost is my loyalty and my being present with my family. Totally, yeah. And that's that's so interesting. And that's a lesson I hear a lot of successful people talking about yeah. is at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many zeros are in your bank account. Right. But, you know, if you miss out on your kids, your grandkids, your peers, your community. Yeah. And that's something that I'm really, and that, that's one of the big reasons I, I took off from Adventure Challenge was like, my community life sucks. Right. You know, it, it, I mean, it, there's elements where it was thriving, but, you know, not spending as much time with my, you know, my siblings, my parents, my my friends, and um, and then also being able to just go pursue what makes me come alive. You know, and you talked about transitioning to business for a season and then being like, ultimately, I want to act. That's what I love to do. Right. And that's, you know, I ultimately, I love that. I love directing, writing, acting, just, just, art in yeah. general, I feel so alive in yeah. doing. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I can, I, I love hearing your story and even your, um, like maybe this is what I would have done a bit differently looking back on it. Yeah. Um, I, I think so without being, without wanting to live in regret, you know what I mean? Ex exactly. Yeah. yeah, totally. What would you say um, you would do differently to pursue acting if you could go back to being 27, 28 with all the information and knowledge you have now? That's a really great question, Brian. Um, I think I would be less, I would care less. Okay, in like which I've way? I've been saying to my staff, we care too much, care yeah. less. less and it doesn't lower mean- Lower stakes maybe? Lower stakes, yeah. yeah. I said like, you know, if the mission overcomes you, mm. takes over, then the mission's lost. Yeah. We have to have fun doing what we're doing. I think knowing what Real quick, I, I want to emphasize that. We need to have fun doing what we're doing. Yeah. If we can't find a way to have fun in what we're doing, then what's the freaking point? Because it's like there's all of these things outside of our control. We don't yeah. know if we're going to take over the world or right. be acting in what we want or direct what we want. But we can say, I'm not going to do this unless I'm having fun. Obviously, yeah. there's time where it's not fun. Yeah, of course. There's the hard work. Yeah. But I, I just, I didn't want to leave that like, yeah. you wanted to make sure, let's have fun in what we're doing. Right, That's because brilliant. the thing is, like, I'll give you an example. Like when I would go for auditions, the stakes would be so high that I would yeah. need to make, I'd need to make payments on my mortgage, on the bills or whatever. Yeah. But then, I mean, people say to you, oh, have fun in an audition. How do you have fun in an audition? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But my, my switch was... Listen, nobody at the moment is paying me to perform, but I'm I'm getting all these auditions. So every time I go to an audition, I'm going to enjoy it because I get to act. It's not my I'm not entitled to it, right? Yeah. I just I I'm, I just get to act because I love it. Love that. Nobody 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 owes it to me. So I went and I started booking more. That's because great. Because I'm like, I'm going to do it because if nobody's paying for me, I'm going to perform and I'm going to do my best. I freaking love that. You know. And the chances of you booking the role are already small. Yeah. So 
in my head going into an audition, it's chances are I'm not going to book this. I'm going to go in and have more fun than anybody right. that's been there. And they're going to see me having the most fun. Right. And I'm going to go back to my life and keep pursuing my stuff. And exactly. if I book it, awesome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? you, and yeah. listen, it, you know, I'm, I'm not my only provider. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I, as you said, I've got to be prepared. Mm -hmm. You can't just always wing things. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got to still be prepared in my craft. Yeah. And then if I go with that lightheartedness or that idea of, I'm going to have fun. I think that translates, man. Mm, yeah, 100%. You know, it's it's actually the... It, 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 you omit what your internal world is, mm -hmm. right? And I know that when I'm stressed, I can emit a very powerful stre stress force and mm -hmm. my employees feel it. But when I'm relaxed, when I'm low stakes, that atmosphere that I emit is tangible. So I think you enter into an audition room or you go into a business meeting, you do whatever you do yeah. for a living and you go in and you transmit what you want to be seen as, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. As a man thinker, so is he. Mm -hmm. So that that's actually a good piece of advice. I think I'd give that to myself too. I'm a little bit younger, but I would say- Oh I, no, I, you're not younger. Just a couple years, Just Fab. a couple <laughs> years, dude. <laughs> but I, I love that. I mean, if you could have a meeting with yourself and be like, hey- Lower the stakes. Lower the stakes. It's it's not the end of the world. And by you hiring the stakes, I have an episode called You'll Always Suck If You're Afraid to Suck. Yeah. And it's I, I talk a lot about I would lose because of the fear of losing. Yeah. Because there was this, I can't afford to lose. So when I go in, I'm not loose. I'm not enjoying it. I'm not in myself. I'm in this robot attitude of I have to win and then I don't win and then it's just more traumatizing I go to the next one and then it just creates a domino effect of failures that aren't benefiting you because you're not being your true authentic self um so I love that I am curious do you think that I, I want to hear you as a dreamer do you want to be in major feature films and be in acting full-time is that something that you could see that would be super exciting because I know you're you're currently running the school, um, but you're doing projects on the side. You were in a you were in a, you've been in a few films recently, yeah. um, and uh, but I'm like, is that what you would want to ultimately doing full time? Is is acting? I would say if you ask me now, mm -hmm. I would say yes. Okay. I'd say like when I produce, I love that as much as acting. Okay, when I direct, I love that as much as acting. But I find because my job is so, it's all consuming. Mm -hmm. When I act, it's like taking a vacation. Okay, yeah. So when I'm on a film set and I'm acting, I can focus on just one thing. Totally. That's the character, that's the yeah. scene. Yeah. When I'm producing and when I'm directing, I'm having to think yeah. of a team of usually around 100 people, mm -hmm. right? There's just no way to yeah. be able to, to be so focused until you're in Video Village and you're saying action mm -hmm. or you're on theater and you're saying, right, and let's go. Yeah. Um, when, when you act, I do think when I act is when I feel most alive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I still have a lot left in me to do it. Mm. You know, at the moment, I just know in myself, it's not necessarily the right time to keep pursuing it full time because I have, totally. I have a mandate and a mission to keep training up other actors. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that I'm not, you know, like I said, you know, I've done, I've only done three movie, three movies over the last couple of years, but nonetheless, I've directed a lot. But I think to answer your question, yes, I do. Okay. I think I want to, I want to, David and I talk about producing more projects mm -hmm. and bringing things to the table, but I think I want to influence the projects as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Would I do mainstream? Yeah, of course I would, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, but I, I am very excited about influencing what we create. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, well, well, I, I, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that I'm not going to see you on the big screen more often. Come on, baby. Yeah, Let's <laughs> I mean, do this it. is going to happen. Do it. I, I have no doubt that we with we this might, face, with that face, Bro, that hairline, the facial so hair. Oh, it's great. I, somebody said to me, I think it was you. You said you've got a great face for podcasts. You do. Thank you. You're a great face for podcasts. <laughs> well, actually, we film these podcasts, oh, so well, your face is, you know, <laughs> we, you know, a small portion of our <laughs> listeners are on uh, YouTube and <laughs> Instagram. But, um, but no, I love that. I, I think we'll probably share a screen someday too. I think. I we'll, think we will. I think mm -hmm. we will. 
Yeah. I think we'll either share a screen mm -hmm. or we'll produce something yeah. that we'll be in together. Yeah. Maybe both. Maybe, you know? maybe both. Yeah. I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that too. I I'm really excited about 2021 um, outside of all of the political shit and right, the COVID exactly. shit. But, yeah. you know, it's like you, you can only control what you can control. So even though there's crazy shit going on in the world, I'm like, I'm still going to go pursue my dreams and, yeah. and make stuff happen. Um, and yeah, I, I think a lot of cool things are going to happen this year. I'm really stoked for. Yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it can't be as bad as last year. Can it, it can't be as bad. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for being on the podcast oh, with me. Thanks for having me. Thanks man. for taking it was time. A blast. Yeah. No, it's always fun to just shoot the shit, and yeah, um, I miss uh, miss having cigar and whiskey nights. We need it. We're both Listen, taking a break from that. We so. are <laughs> taking a break from cigars and whiskey. Not too long. You're taking six months. Yeah. So I'm doing six months. No, no cigars. No nicotine and no alcohol. Uh, I'm getting on a super strict sleeping and workout regimen. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm like, I, my entrepreneur, um, CEO years put a toll on my body. Yep. I feel like I have now the body of a 38 year old, 39 year old when I'm but only 27, still young, still young but I, <laughs> I need to get back to my twenties <laughs> yeah, and do. really center myself because yeah. I think we're going to be, me and my brother are writing a TV show that we're hoping to be filming, right. um, late summer. So I want to be mentally ready for that. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be a good year. So we'll, we'll, we can still, I might be able to allow cigars because I don't really inhale those. You just those, said it. You know? You just said it. Yeah. End of January. Yeah. When I finish my fast. Yeah. Cigars. I think I'd do cigars. Yeah, you will. Yeah. Cause yeah, you, you, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, I, I, I used to smoke a vape so much yeah. and you just, it's so easy to smoke a vape because it's inside. You can smoke it whenever you right. want. I'm sorry for all my listeners. Uh, who are the conservative who are offended by that, but I just do. I love a good vape and grape flavored. Oh my God. But uh, even that I'm giving up. Cause I'm like, it's just, it's not beneficial for my body, yeah, you know? So right. it's like this year I'm, as I'm transitioning, it's like, I'm, I only want to do things that are, you know, benefiting my body, but um, let's do it. January. We'll do a little cigar night. Oh, glory be. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the first week of February. First week of February. I'm, yeah. I'm in, I'm in Dallas at the end of Jan, but okay. yeah, let's do it. Sounds good. And Got you do look 39. I appreciate that. You yeah. do. Yeah, thank you. I think it's, I was spending a lot of time with my business partner, Ben Day. Yeah, they yeah, say yeah. you start to morph. And he looks like 27. He does. He does look like 27. So, I mean, you look considerably older than him. Dude, right? I saw a picture <laughs> of when we both started Adventure Challenge. We look significantly younger. Really? I'm like, the last four years have put such <laughs> a toll on our bodies and faces. and uh, But it's all good, though. Um, guys, the one of the biggest takeaways that I want to just ingrain in your mind for this podcast is lower the stakes. And I can't put enough emphasis on that where, I mean, you guys, if, for those of you who listen to all the episodes of this podcast, like there's, there's mistakes. I'm not grammatically correct with everything. You know, it's inconsistent how we, we don't post every week. We post every other week. And, and, and that's one thing that I'm, I'm wanting to embrace in life. It's like, guys, no one has all of their shit together. And instead of pretending like we have all of our shit together and saying, well, I'm faking it till I make it, it's like, no, why don't you just be true to where you're at? And in that process, people can actually help you grow. Because instead of saying, oh, I have all my shit together, I know what I'm doing, I have to portray this image of perfection, and everybody looks and goes, oh, I guess they have their shit together, I can't really contribute to that. When you're being true to where you're at in the moment, you're being humble and you're being open to your current circumstances, you're, you're actually sending energy out that says, I'm open to help. So I have people reach out to me and go, hey, I, I know how you could, um, you know, do better with your podcast. I know how you could do better as a speaker. I know you could do better as an entrepreneur. I know you could do better as a social media person. And, and it's just keeping open and saying like the stakes aren't that high. I don't need to pretend like all of my stuff is together. I don't need to act like everything's together. And then for you people pursuing and there you're in the daily grind of your passions, like guys, it's going to be okay. If you don't get it, it's going to be okay. If it takes a little bit longer than you assume, I would just say, please don't put this time limit on yourself of when you have to be successful. Oh, my brother is now successful. Oh, my friend is now successful and he's in his, you know, early 20s or he's in his early 30s. And so I have to do that now. Like you have your own time frame, your own time limit. It could give, it could be a decade before you really get it, but find ways, as Fab says, to enjoy the process. If you're in Hollywood right now pursuing acting and you're auditioning and you're not booking anything and you're like, I'm freaking miserable and I'm not going to stop being miserable until I book a role, you're kidding yourself. 
you guys need to go watch the movie Soul. Have you seen Disney Soul? Uh, no, I haven't yet. Okay, no. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm Jamie not going to Jamie Foxx. Jamie yeah. Foxx is the main character and man, I'm telling you it's it's one of those movies you look at and say, "Yeah, when you put so much high stakes on this thing and then maybe you achieve it and you go, "Okay, now what?" Like if you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy when you achieve it. And that's what we talked a lot about with Raphael when he was on it. So he, he's talking about his weight loss journey. Uh, he was like, I won't be happy until I weigh this much. Well, now I weigh this much. Oh, so it wasn't a weight problem. It was a self-love problem. Right. And so for you pursuing acting, for you pursuing directing or art, or you pursuing entrepreneurship, I'll be happy once I create my first million dollar business. No, you won't. You, I, I promise. I can speak from experience that the dollar amount in your bank does not change your level of happiness. If anything, it actually will cause you to go into depression because you realize that the antidote that you thought was going to bring you happiness doesn't really exist in that. And so have fun in the process. And when you achieve it, it's going to be so much more fun because your hot posture is going to be different. You're going to have a lot more self-love and this is going to be a lot more of an enjoyable ride. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, rate the podcast. Give me your guys' feedback. I love uh, when you guys send me your messages on Instagram. Um, I, it takes a little bit for me to get back to people sometimes, but thank you so much for all of your shares and posting. Hopefully we have another episode for you next Tuesday. I'm so excited. Thanks for listening to The Fail Journal. And I think that's it. Have a good one. Happy New Year's. Go get, go get your shit done. Go kill, go kill your uh, bucket list items. Go check off your dream marks. Go buy your Lamborghinis and pursue your dreams and good shit like that. All right, we'll talk to you guys later.